Welcome to the Churros e Tacticas podcast where we have decided <laughs> that for the rest of the season, no one gets to be excited about doing the intro. We all need to go in a corner and think about what our teams have done. And until Churros expands to a four-person entity, which also consists of a La Real fan or a Colchonero, we just don't get to be happy. So joining me, Kian Subani, to or break Villarreal. down, or Villarreal, or whoever in that mix right now, but definitely those two that I mentioned. So joining me, Kian Subani, to break down um, things like fourth place Real Madrid and 12th place Barcelona, among many other things, <laughs> is Diego Lorin. Diego, how you doing? It's crazy. I'm not good, man. I'm not good. Um, on a personal level, I don't know if our listeners or you yourself remember that uh, I was uh, on the verge of uh, vomits last time we spoke. Well, it turns out, Kian, I've got uh, something going on internally that is actually causing that. It wasn't uh, a mere uh, uh, food uh, or, yeah, stomach. Well, it is a stomach virus. So it wasn't something that I've ate, like, a, uh, you know, bad food or anything. And uh, so I cannot eat. I haven't been eating normally for quite a while, just, you know, little caldo soups and things, which I guess in a way it is good, you know, doing a little detox and everything. Uh, but it does annoy me that I just you – know, it annoys me watching other people eat regular food when I'm on this, like – strict special diet that leaves me hungry and grumpy and on top of that having to see Barca drop further down the table and just misery get add, added on to misery get on and added on to misery see so, this is this is terrible Barcelona look what you've done to to my <laughs> dear friend Diego Lorin he can't eat now he has a virus <laughs> no see I didn't know that so um, I'm sorry to hear hopefully it's a it's sorry. a good it's a relatively quick recovery time is it or is it a very long term so. lingering thing? Okay. It should be. Should be. Should be about a week or so, yeah. Oh, it's not so bad. Uh, all right. Prayers up for our man Diego Lorin. Um and I remember texting you on Saturday. I'm trying to think of the time. Yeah. Uh, it was a Saturday afternoon or slash evening nighttime in Spanish time because I was waiting for Zidane to come in the press conference on Zoom sitting in, in my basement. And I texted you and I said um, you must be happy. And then I said some other things too. And you said, mm-hmm. you, 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 yeah, I am happy. This was obviously before well, Barcelona you, game, right? Your, your, your exact words were, I hope you enjoyed that. Oh, that's what and it was. Yeah. My reply was, I did enjoy that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. You enjoyed it. Did you also enjoy the Atleti Barca game? <laughs> I did not. Mm. I did not. I, I enjoyed the first, what was it, the first 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, Barcelona were okay. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have, you know, both. I mean, this was an exciting matchup. Uh, it was your classic, uh, you know, sort of two boxers ex- ex- exchanging punches and nobody holding back in those you know, opening 10, 15 minutes with, I think it was Llorente hitting the post and, uh, you know, Barca song sh- showing signs of, um, you know, just at least. Uh, uh, Pressure and, and, and eagerness to get on the score sheet early. Uh, chances from uh, Griezmann, I think it was, Messi uh, and company. I think it was Longlez with a header as well. Um, you know, Ter Stegen at that point still pulling very good save, saves. I think it was Saul, if I'm not mistaken, from way outside the box, yep. testing Ter Stegen on early. Uh, so all those signs pointed to that it was going to be a, a, an exciting match. And, and I was on the verge of, at the end of the, sort of nearing the end of the first half, I was on the verge of tweeting out something, which I didn't in the end. And that was, and I'll say it here on the podcast, I was on the verge of tweeting out. I said, look, it's clear that we are indeed watching the champion of the 2021 La Liga season in Atletico de Madrid. And I said, however, what I will, what I will, uh, so that, that was my first prediction. I was like, that's prediction number one, which I you know, stated, what was it, two weeks ago. And my prediction number two was going to be that Barca, whatever will happen, Barca will finish above Real Madrid in the league standings. That was going to be my bold prediction number two. Mm-hmm. Uh, after this loss, I don't know, you know, sort of happy I didn't tweet out that tweet because I think even that has taken a serious hit. Uh, despite the fact that Barca still have two games in hand, um, 
uh, with all the injuries. You know, you got Pique out for five months. You got Sergio Roberto out for two. You got Dembu's out indefinitely with the, with something with a shoulder. I'm not, I don't think it's going to be a long term thing, but you know, it's it, they haven't put a time fr- like, um, a time limit or a time frame on on his injury. Obviously, Umtiti out, um, and, and, and you know, and company. Uh, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Araujo is still out. Um, so it's, it's it's just it's gonna be one of those seasons, man. It's gonna be one of those depressive seasons where, you know, well, I'll, I think Kules, we need to be happy if this team is able able capable of finishing in the top four. So I watched this game on Sunday, and I tried my very very best to stay away from the score. Turns out that was impossible. I, I had the willpower to do it, but I just I don't know where I saw. I saw like, I don't know if it's it, this classifies as a meme, but there was a lot of like, there was like a, that, that picture of the touch that Carrasco takes to put it through Ter Sagan's oh. legs. So that was circulating yeah. a lot and I couldn't escape that. I was like, okay, yeah. so that, that probably means something. And then I, I ran into the score. Um, mm. So, and then I watched it on Sunday. And some of the things I had read about Barcelona be, before watching the game, and then I watched the first half, I was like, this it seems a bit exaggerated that Barcelona were bad. I don't, you know, they weren't great, but the, off the first half alone, I was like, this is not a bad performance. If they lost one nil, you know, they're playing they're playing pretty good in the first half. But I think what happened was that the overall theme of this game. Watch that once I watched the full ninety, you see the momentum shifts. Mm. You see Atleti's confidence growing, especially yeah. after the goal, um, and then you see just kind of like. Um, that I thought actually their first half was better than the second half in some ways, actually, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. But I mm-hmm. really enjoyed some of the things that they did in the first half, which we'll get to. But I don't think Barcelona were that bad in the first half. But I think what the overall theme was and like eventually what I, I saw from that Barcelona team was that they seemed a little bit unimaginative. They weren't sure what to do. Mm. I think Koeman still doesn't, is unsure of how to react when things don't go his way. He has one scheme. He has one way of playing. And that's the way what he rolls with. Um, and so that was my assessment overall. Without getting into kind of the nitty gritty details of this game, what what do you th- are were you were you disappointed in Barcelona's performance? Like the result aside, well, like I said in the beginning, at the beginning allowed me to be optimistic, uh, and it wasn't until sort of I saw these Barca basically revert to. Uh, your Madrid style, like if you will, desperate crosses being put into the box that we're finding, you know, recipients. But obviously, with a guy like Jan Oblak in 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 between the stakes, it's very hard to get a goal past him. Um, but that's really, I mean, I think that's a fair ass- assessment. It seemed like there was no other alternative other than crossing the ball and seeing uh, who can get their head to it. And seeing if you know that would end up in a goal, that that basically was what we started to see from from Barca from that point on. Uh, you know, Dembélé I thought was offering what he could um, on the on the right flank. I think that um, you know, again in the beginning he looked l- like somebody that was willing to take the game to Atletico and 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 take on defenders one on one and trying to look. F- he made an effort to look for Griezmann, uh, made an effort to uh, um, find the open man as well. Um, uh, you know, the long range effort that I remember from Sergio Roberto himself was. Which, which was from way outside the box was one of the few uh, moments that Barca decided to pull the trigger and, and, and try to you know test Jan Oblak. Other than that, there wasn't, besides those crosses that I mentioned earlier, there wasn't much else from this team. Um, mind you, I think it was that shot that actually also got Sergio Roberto in, injured for the next upcoming two months. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's... it's it, it's just going to be one of those seasons, Kian. It, it's just going to be like this, man. It's it's one of those points right now where I think anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, you know, I forgot to mention Sergi, uh, Sergio Busquets, obviously, is also on the injury list. You're not going to get what you would get from these players if this team were in a different dynamic. Um you know, I think it's all just coming together. I think this, the current state of the club uh, institutionally, 
as well as uh, from a sporting perspective, you know, it's just going to leave so much to desire and we will not see a big change uh, take place until there is some, I guess, normality restored on a day-to-day basis and that starts you know obviously from uh from up in the in 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 the offices so once a new board uh, is able to settle in and and start talking to the players there's so many things going on behind the scenes as well with you know the the contracts talks the the the, the they're trying to reduce the weight bill etc which is being met with pushback from the players um so you know i think it's fair to say that that just <laughs> what you're going to get from these players is not their maximum output, not their maximum performance. I remember you and I, once we spoke at length uh, with regards to how much the psychological aspect will affect a player's output, uh, where my argument yeah. was, you know, it will severely affect the, the their output. And I think that is, is the reality of these players, this group of players today. Um, there's just a, a sense of pessimism. You see it, you know, as soon as last week when, when Leo Messi came back from international duties, his statements talking about he is tired of being, you know, in, in the middle and in, in the eye of the hurricane, as they say, when it comes to all of the um, the problems surrounding the club, where he feels that he is always being pointed out, out to be the, the major culprit and the one at fault. Um, you know, Kuman, I think, is doing good, if anything, leaving him out of the squad uh, now, he won't be traveling with the team to to the Ukraine to play Kiev. Uh, neither will Frankie de Jong. I think these kind of rests will probably benefit these the the, the players right now, or you know the heavyweights that is. Uh, and instead, let some fresh blood, let some you know the guys that have uh, some of the players that have less minutes uh, prove their worth, or you know dare I say, turn this situation around. I mean, if Ricky Puch is not going to get some minutes at this point in the season or at this point of the situation, then I don't know when he will. Yeah. But uh, That's now were, or never Ronald type Kuman, thing. It's now or never, yeah. And, and, and it's... it's uh, if it, Like I said, just to finish my, my thought here, Ken, if I were Kuman, I mean, now's really the time, I think, where you would, one, uh, count on these players that... that you know that haven't had much influence or much of an impact, and if anything, can uh, with the minutes that they are they're granted and with um, these opportunities, or maybe make you know maybe make light of the situation. And by that, I don't mean winning the Champions League or anything else for that matter. I simply mean I, I simply mean you know saving the face of uh, of the team right now because you know again just to reiterate the the obvious things are looking ugly at the moment. <clears throat> Yeah, the the Kiev game is only interesting to me just from like a pure tryout standpoint. Like, what, who mm. can impress, and what does that mean? Can can Pooch play? If again, like to your point, to piggyback off that, if Pooch doesn't play in this game, no, De Young, because as I in my mind, I was like maybe De Young gets called up just to play the center back position again because you're missing everybody in the center back position. Yeah, and sure. also that report, that, well. that report that um, that came out that. Kuman was told that if Umtiti plays like two or three games in a row, then he has pain. Then so you, that's not an option. Like he can't do that. There's just so much in uh, in Barcelona's defense that that have issues right now. And and that that PK challenge was um, where where he limps off. I mean that that certainly was probably the icing on the cake, um, and not in a good way. It was just like yeah. it, it, the the whole thing was it was kind of it was just a it was a bad and unfortunate scene. But I think there's – so we have plenty of time for the big picture stuff. I thought it would be interesting to talk about this game, if only to praise Atleti. Because I think – so first of all, they started off with like a 5-3-2 or a 3-5-2, depending on how you interpret that lineup. It kind of morphs in and out. With Trippier and Carrasco, maybe the surprising one is a left back. But although with, with, with Simeone, anyone can play anywhere. And, you know, Marcus Llorente playing as a striker, Carrasco playing as left back. Nothing is weird anymore at this point. But, but I thought that was interesting because, like you know, Carrasco, whether you interpret him as a left winger or as a left wing back, as a left back, he was very defensive minded, but also very interesting as you saw on the goal. He playing off the shoulder of Barcelona's defensive line at times, and I thought the way they were set up, whether he or Trippier was caught out at a position, like. Savage or Jimenez or somebody would just come over and cover right away. So defensively, they look good. 
Um, and I thought that was an interesting kind of way to play, um, to compensate for not mm-hmm. having a striker like, like, like Suarez, but also providing defensive security against a potent attack. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought the biggest takeaway from uh, Atletico's perspective, I know Jao Felix is, the, is kind of like the, uh, the poster child of today. Marcos Llorente in that first half was unbelievable. Just like mm. the way he was dribbling out of pressure, running into that half space, but then also like this is like a new thing I think he's been he's been adding to his game. He's always been making that run, but then he just kind of dips his shoulder, fakes a cross, goes down the byline, gets a really good cross in, just running into that half space constantly. He had one shot in there where he hits the bar. He had one like where he's like swarmed at the corner flag, and he has this unreal touch in the tight space to get himself out of it. It's just like no matter what predicament he finds himself in, he finds a way. And you just look at players like him. And you know you know me. I was the biggest Marcos Llorente fan on earth. I don't like – I was like a flag bearer. Even I yeah. – even I am, am blown away at his progress and his development and his evolution more importantly. Um, just, just incredible. I wanted to ask you about Griezmann. What did you think about his performance? Mm-hmm. I mean, all eyes were set on him. Um, you know, again, during the international duty, he was, of course, in the limelights or his family, I should say, uh, for all the shots that were being fired to towards Messi. And with Messi coming back and making those statements, it was kind of like, oh, shit. OK, what's, gonna, what's it going to be like now? Um, and to my surprise and, and I guess um, to my what, what should I say to my my pleasure? No, but to my dismay uh no no, no, to my surprise delight to my surprise but also like yeah to my delight thank you very (laughs) much um we had Messi, you know looking for griezmann on several occasions uh where griezmann could have you know uh, had he been in form or had he gotten uh, a better opportunity with a to get a shot on goal off even score a goal uh there was one instance as well where again Messi tried to i think chip the ball over uh, to uh, Griezmann at the far post. He was coming in from the right side. And um, Griezmann, that is. And it just went basically flying over. It was a bad pass. And we saw Messi sort of profusely apologizing uh, to Griezmann, saying, you know, my bad, my bad. And, and, and even going so far as to turning around twice and lifting up his hand. Um, a little detail that I don't know if other people noticed, but while I was watching it, I was going, oh, you know, what? Well, Look at that. I mean, it's uh, it's a good thing that at least uh, maybe the, the 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 situation or the relationship off the pitch uh, is, on the pitch is is, is cordial mm. and um, and polite to the point where Leo is looking for Griezmann. Um, and to your point with Griezmann, I liked what I saw from Griezmann early on. Um, Griezmann was, you know, uh, I mean, he was the number nine, right? So we saw both Dembélé and uh, uh, on occasions as well, Leo Messi looking for Griezmann. And uh, those are all positive signs. The ball, the balls were getting to him as well. He was fighting to get into position, obviously, against his former teammates, his former club. But he knows that that is a difficult task. Uh, nobody uh, here is new to how good Atletico is defensively. And in particular, you know, man marking or marking players like Griezmann that, um, yeah, I mean, have to make an extra effort to get free and look for space inside the box. But at least we saw that the work rate and the effort was there. Um, and again, I'm primarily referring to what we saw from him in that first half, particularly because I don't think that the same can be said from anybody in the second half where there was a clear drop, I think, in intensity um, and, and maybe belief as well. Um Body language didn't look the same for me in the second half. I knew that it was over in the second half. I I, I didn't feel that that we were going to get a, sh- a chance to really get one up on Atletico at that point in time, which is you know is a lot saying saying that from a team like Barca uh, already throwing in the towel in the second half, uh, and maybe that's for me from from you know a perspective obviously looking at it on the screen is is premature to say, but that's just the the, the sensation, the feeling that I got. Uh, and I, you know, don't single out Griezmann because I kind of put that on the whole team that I felt, you know, that that's it. That you know, this team um, just doesn't have it in it this season. And and I personally started to feel pretty dejected at that point. You know, with even um, 
I mean, I think it was four substitutes, wasn't it, in the second half? Uh, Coutinho, Tirincao, Dest came in uh, quite early on, and Braithwaite at the end as well. I mean, I didn't feel that any of those changes would have a tremendous impact. Um, and and so, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit, bro, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit negative. I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but Griezmann was okay in the first half. In the second half, though, that the whole team, I felt, was it was just gone. Yeah, that's about right. I thought, again, because I went into this game hearing and reading a lot of Barcelona and Griezmann criticism, that first half maybe changed my mind a little bit and, and thinking maybe people exaggerated that. But that first half, I actually thought Griezmann, um, he was very active. We'll put it that way. Very active, active. That's moving a great off way the to ball, getting, it, yeah. be, getting between the yes. lines, getting behind the lines, looking, looking yes. up for it. To getting in that Dembele cross was a uh, was a really good effort. Some good runs behind Carrasco, um, but that that same run he had a really heavy touch, which uh, which was oddly uh, oddly was oddly ugly. terrible. Yeah, um, and with I think what also happened was that for large stretches of this game, and maybe large stretches generous, some stretches in this game, and especially in that first half. The, the main source of your offensive creation was Usman Dembele dribbling on the right side. Yeah. I think eventually Absolutely. what happened is that Atleti kind of figured him out. You know, they started to, to defend him a little bit better and taking mm. him out of the game. <clears throat> and um, and I think, I think what also happened is that, and this is more of a theme of the season, Messi from a, a pure creation standpoint is still the best in the league despite not being the version of Messi we, we're used to, even that version of Messi mm. is still the best offensive creator in the league, and the numbers back that up. But his goal scoring wow. has been off. So, yeah. um, Churosi Tacticas just retweeted this, which I thought it was interesting from XG Philosophy, which I'll read out, out loud. By the way, if you're not following um, at Churros Tacticas on Twitter, you're missing amazing content like us just like stealing people's stuff retweeting Who's and not calling their own um <laughs> so everyone's following us Kia. Lionel Messi has scored just one non-penalty goal um from 4.33 non-penalty expected goals so far this season that's the largest underperformance of any La Liga player so like the the gist of it is basically he's not scoring which in the past mm. he was and so Part of the reason why you already have three losses after what? How many games? Seven, eight. It's insane. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, eight, eight, eight. After eight games, three losses. Nine. No, eight, eight. Th- after eight, eight games, no, three nine. losses, two draws. I don't know. Google's no, nine, telling nine, you eight. played eight. Yeah. Real Madrid eight, has played eight, nine, eight. but you've only played eight. Correct, eight. <clears throat> so, so yeah, that that's. That's a big concern, which I think will normalize at some point, which will solve some problems. Because I don't see Messi not scoring for the whole season. Look, I tell you what, tell you what, man. Um, last podcast, you we talked about, we were asked about Messi's situation, and and I basically again went out on a limb and and said that his future is far and away from the Camp Nou uh, as of the next season uh, rolls around. Uh, this new or this morning, I opened uh, my laptop uh, as I usually do. Normally, I have a nice coffee. Uh, I cannot drink coffee for a week, which is highly annoying, adding to my annoyance here, Kian. What do you substitute so having, co- uh, coffee my, with now? Since you can't drink it, well, now I, I can have. I, I can only have like manzanilla, like chamomile teas, mm. and, which I like chamomile. But but in the morning, you know, I gotta yeah. get the juice flowing and the motor going. Mm. Chamomile is not going to do the job. In any case, I uh, noticed that my uh, former colleague and uh, still friend, Samar Hunter, was making the newspaper headlines I everywhere. Saw that. I was like, I was looking at the source. I was like, <laughs> Samar Hunter. Good for her. <laughs> you saw that? Yeah. Yeah, good for her. And to my, to my surprise as well, is I, I mean, she's an excellent, uh, you know, top notch professional presenter. I didn't know she was in the loop, in the know how, um, you know, with sort of the ins and outs of. Uh, club situations and people at the club and everything but she got the scoop that uh, in fact manchester city will not be making a move for leo messi because of his age and because of his wage um 
that makes sense. It right? totally makes uh, sense to me, actually. Yeah. But makes sense when 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 you lay those arguments out. Um, having said that, I I just I I, I'm, I remain skeptical for two reasons. One one is Leo Messi is well aware of the you know the fact that the financial situation for the clubs everywhere uh, is dire or, or or you know the cash they're all cash strapped. So if I put myself in the shoes of Leo Messi and knowing that money is not a concern or not an issue, rather, wouldn't you rather be looking at a very, very good, solid project that allows you to finish your car- career as high as possible or, or ambitious as, you know, an ambitious project that allows you to perhaps fight for those trophies that you're uh, still playing the game to this day for as opposed to getting that 100 million check uh, at the end of the season. I know we're talking about a lot of money, but this guy's been making a lot of money ever since the age of 15, 16. Um, I don't, you know, I, I want my point being here, Kian, is that I I don't know if money will be an obstacle. I mean, I don't think you're if you're Leo Messi, you can demand, first of all, so much money. Uh, and second of all, if that's really a priority for a player like that, you know what I mean? Like he I, wants to, he wants to, he wants to make history. Like that, that, that's that'll be his main concern. He knows that he's 33 uh, years old. He'll be only getting older as of now. So uh, his concern surely will be: How do I finish my career, and what will my, will my legacy be come at the end of it? Uh, come at the end of it. I I totally get your point, and I think it's valid. Um, at this point, there's a there's probably a threshold like, what what do you do with an extra few hundred, even million? I <laughs> mean, that that's the mm-hmm. kind of that's the kind of money right. he's made. So, obviously, a lot of people will say, well, money is money, and everyone's going to take the the highest amount of money. But my point is, Messi's going to get paid no matter what, whether it's X amount yeah. or X amount. I, I we kind of saw this with James Harden turning down fifty million. Right. Right here with Houston, there you go. Um, where it's yeah. like he's going to get paid whether it's Houston or Brooklyn. So him getting paid a little bit less, but also maybe going to a scenario which he has more fun and he actually wins a championship is more valuable to him at this stage of his career. Messi can fall in that category. The other thing is that, so the argument that City wouldn't pay that only holds true when he's when Messi's under contract. But his con- it, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't his contract? That that thing happens again where it expires in June, right? So he mm-hmm. could still walk for free in the summer, free, can he yeah. not? Which would make things yeah, yeah, easier absolutely. for for City, not for Barca, but for City. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely, and 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 he'll get a fat ass signing uh, sign on bonus as well. So uh, Victor Font said, "Put all those to bed. Don't worry." He said, uh, "He said I've already notified Manchester City CEO." that Messi will stay with us and win Champions League titles with us. So let's put to bed. <laughs> well, of course he'll say that because Soriano is, uh, I don't know if they're personal friends, but I mean, they, Soriano is an ex-board member. He's Catalan, he's from the city. I uh, would assume that they know each other, if not in, directly, indirectly. Uh, Barcelona is a small city. So, um, I, and he, you know, he probably dropped him a WhatsApp or uh Gave him a quick buzz and they shared some laughs and some stories. Uh, and he's going to say what he has to say. The reality, though, is right now Victor Font is not president of Football Club Barcelona. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I still think, I still think, given everything that's happening at the moment, given the fact that Leo Messi, I mean, as you just pointed out yourself, is still, uh, you know, the best player in the world. Um, that he will not want to be part of um, a rebuilding phase, you know, of, of this of, 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 uh, of the club of his life. Yes, but I, I think that he will just simply want something that can produce and some deliver trophies now, as he is on the wrong side of his thirties. And and I don't think that any president can sway his opinion on that. And this is just purely based on you know simple, you know, just personal opinion and, and just rationalizing things in my own head as opposed to any inside information of which unfortunately for our listeners I have none. Why well, I I think the key here is also that I don't think Barcelona improves enough next summer for him 
to win no. a Champions League title. I very cautiously say that because no. obviously there's a chance I'm wrong. Uh, but I just don't see the path. Like, yeah. there's not really, especially no, with the financial situation. So, uh, yeah. Saturday was a roller coaster for me because Real Madrid <laughs> played really bad against Villarreal, especially in the second half. But that's why, that's why I was like, man, we're gonna at least finish above Real Madrid because <laughs> look at them. And then, yeah. and then um, on Saturday. I, uh, I, I, I saw the news that Serge Ibaka is leaving Toronto, and he was one of my favorite players. And he was going to the Clippers mm. to join forces with Kawhi Leonard. And I was like, this is like almost, it didn't hit me on like Marco Cirante going to Atleti because that's just a totally different ballgame. But it's like <laughs> it, the Clippers are just taking these resources from us. And I was like, oh, man, I really love Serge because he was such a lovable figure. And then Marc Gasol walking to, <laughs> and I really love Marc. I don't, you know, it's not Marc Gasol peak, but again, it, I think it's like the characters were losing more than the player itself. And Marc Gasol was still an amazing defensive player. So that was my roller coaster of Saturday. And then, and then Atleti Barca was nice. And then obviously Marco Ciorante playing good. And then it was like, oh, and then another roller coaster. It was, it was quite an emotional roller coaster. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh man we have like the, what the, the sobani household was a mess this weekend <laughs> would you say we have about 10 maximum 15 minutes to talk about other things so where do you want to take it from here yeah man um well listen i i uh, we've got to talk about la liga leader we've got to talk about real sociedad who are um uh, you know, when, when everybody talks about, uh, or everybody, I'm grossly generalizing here, but when we all talk about who will be champion of this league season, it's uh, Atletico obviously is now on the tip of all our tongues. But, you know, give credit where it is due. They've played two more matches than their uh, closest rival. They've got three more points than Atleti as well. But right now sitting at the top is continues to be Real Sociedad. Uh, play 10, one seven. Draw two, lost just the one, and um, it was a highly entertaining game. With uh, despite the scoreline only being one nil uh, against uh, obviously a very good and stubborn Cali side, Cali uh, who have continued to make their way to be this season's newcomer surprise package. Uh, I think they're still in the top five. If I'm not, I don't have it in front of me. I think they're I think they're Ooh, in the right now, but I think they dropped yeah. slightly. Yeah. But but okay, they're, they're no, they're fifth. They're fifth. Yeah, they're fifth. They're, yeah, okay. But um, and and really, what stood out for me from that match was one. Why are we not seeing a version of Yanuzais like this more often? Because he was awesome in this game. Um, he sort of he sort of did everything that you would want to. You know that you would expect from a player like this. It kind of reminds me of when he was playing for United and doomed a failure, and 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 he played one good match, and everybody, oh sorry, and everybody, uh, all the Man United fans got excited, thinking that they were going to get that, you know, Zanu Zayt from that that point on, and then he dipped away again. Um, you know, he, this guy is really talented, and he can play some really good football. Um, uh, he was just a constant threat for Cadiz and, and, and showing that he's creative, uh, able to get into open spaces uh, by dribbling the ball, getting past defenders, putting in good passes as well. And the second surprise, I guess you could call it, is that Isaac, or Alexander Isaac has only scored two goals this season so far. So despite that this Real Sociedad is the leader of La Liga at the moment, um, their center forward has, you know, yet to really start getting, uh, get get the motor running, let's say, and uh, start banging in some goals, uh, because, um, yeah, I mean, last season, and and I I I don't know if you knew this, Skian, but you know, last season obviously he was a really exciting uh, uh, addition to Real Sociedad, making plenty of headlines, having some very big matches as well, but he only scored nine goals in the league. Yeah. Well, it took him um, like exactly he didn't get going until um, the second half of the season, really. Until and, the second yeah. half, yeah, yeah. Obviously, in the Copa del Rey, he scored. I think it was seven goals in seven matches. But in the league itself, like uh, my point being is that for center forward, 
you expect more goals, and especially somebody as talented uh, like uh, Alexander Izak, I think. You, you know, he, he, he needs to start putting more goals in the back of the net. Well, one of the things um, about them, and in, in this game in particular, actually, um, they created so much, and despite, like, 1-0 is very, very flattering to Cadiz, I'd say, because they... Because Real Sociedad was all over them, and Cadiz didn't even... They didn't even have a single shot inside the box. And um, <clears throat> and and the two shots that they had were way outside the box and didn't even come, didn't even didn't even hit the target. Meanwhile, both both Januzaj and Silva, David Silva, put a ball on a platter for Mikel Marino, one from a corner, and one from uh, from open play. And there was one where David Silva, like just some beautiful dribbling and cutbacks from the right side, and he, and he, then he just puts this beautiful in swinging ball on Mikel Merino's head, which he misses. And so this was like, it wasn't just 1-0. It was, the, the eye test was was really amazing with them. And also, on, on as a holist, from a holistic point of view, they've scored 20 goals and conceded four goals. Plus 16 goal differential. They're just, they, they're, they're, they're real. They're, they're here. Um, I was skeptical about what will happen when they lose Odegaard, but David Silva fit like, fits like a glove. He does, and he has that winning mentality too. It's just, it's real. It's it's uh, it's real. And so now we start getting into the discussion of like, okay, so we have a pretty good sample size of of Villarreal, of Real, of um, Real Sociedad, and of Atleti. And now the question is, can they be there in April or May? Yeah. Can they still be there? Yeah. And I hope yes, mm. because I'm really excited. This is kind of like an exaggerated um, concern that we had last season. Remember, like, well, the top two have mm. regressed, but the league as a whole has mm. gotten better. So how do we feel about that mm. when Real Madrid and Barcelona might not be able to compete with the Bayerns and Cities and Liverpools and whoever? But then we have all these mm. teams like Villarreal, Real Sociedad, etc., Atletico, who, who can compete with... I guess the second tier, but also on their day, maybe the first tier. Like Atletico, at this point, you know, I, I think their odds to win the Champions League are among like the lowest among all the big teams. It's not a mm-hmm. terrible bet. I don't bet. I don't gamble. I don't encourage it. But like, it's not. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like put my life savings against them if they had to play against Liverpool again in the Champions League. You know what I mean? Like, it's they're. Yeah, solid, solid, really solid. No, for for sure, for sure, for sure, absolutely. And look, I, I hope that they do end up in a very tight title race, and you know, may the best team win. It would be for the league, I think, really exciting to have, say, a, a three horse race be made up of uh, Aleti, Real Sociedad, and, and Villarreal. I think that would be something really refreshing, uh, and will be received with with open arms for for most La Liga fans whether you're neutral or not i mean you know i think all of uh, uh, for sure i don't know about madridistas because you know you guys uh, are capable of winning titles at, at, at any league in any situation um but you know we've kind of resigned and, and 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 admit the fact okay let's hope that we can finish in the top four because clearly this is not a team that is going to be fighting for the league title i don't know how madridistas feel uh i'll let you be the voice of uh, all of the millions of madridistas around the world Kian. i think that real madrid is in trouble but they can still win anything on their day that's the way I. Mm-hmm. This is my read on Real Madrid. It has been like that for some time. I don't think yeah. <clears throat> they are favorites at all. But I think if you like, if like everyone's healthy and you put them in a Champions League quarterfinal against any team, you wouldn't bet on them, but you wouldn't bet against them either. I just think they have something to them that they can figure it out even if it's through black magic, through individual talent. The problem is the 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 prob it's we don't have enough time to discuss the problems right now. But we they have problems and the biggest problem is they don't have a player to transcend their tactical issues right now. Like they did with Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. if I was like that's like the elevator pitch of the problems. But they have a lot of tactical issues. 
what's interesting will be very interesting to see and what could potentially I think dictate the rest of the season at least in the Champions League is this uh, midweek clash against the very informed Inter side that will be able to count on uh, Lukaku this time around and Lukaku who's been uh, I don't think I'm going stretching this one too far when I say that along with Ibrahimovic probably the you know the top striker in the Serie A this season uh, well, there is one. That he there's one dude. His name is Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't know if you've heard of him, but like I said, with Ibrahimovic, I think Lukaku has been the, <laughs> the two main strikers. <laughs> I gave you Messi um, gold. I said he was still the best creator in the league. You can't even throw something here, Cristiano's way. <clears throat> I'll throw you a bone. Uh, one thing, nah, the old man yeah. still got it though, man. I mean, both Cristiano and and Ibrahimovic, Ibrahimovic especially. The guy looks like he's in his mid twenties at some point, uh, at, at some moments during the games. I mean, it's 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 pretty remarkable. It Gat- really Gattuso is. The said way that these uh, guys take care of their bodies. After that Napoli game, Gattuso said that Zlatan is stronger now than he was ten years ago, and I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> I, he just looks. It's not even like a cute, like old man story. Oh, like oh, this guy's playing pretty good. He, like he is like actually one of the best strikers in the world right now. Complete, right now, exactly. complete like so lethal in front of goal. Um, also, like the oh the God. first goal he scored against Napoli, like just that leap and his ability to get to it. <laughs> By the way, did you see Ennis series header against Celta? That was a leap and a half. Yeah. That was phenomenal. You should go watch deal. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. We that, very... that whole game. What? Mm. Okay. No, that that whole game it, it kind of uh cemented Sevilla again as the you know, the team that we have grown accustomed or at least expect to see, right? Uh if they were having their their problems in the beginning of the season, uh I think this resounding four two uh kind of puts them back into uh uh, you know, back on track to be uh, the Sevilla that, 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 you know, we will see moving forward. I mean, I think it's, it, I don't know how many wins now on the trot, but, but, you know, they, they've kind of left behind the, the darker days, I think from where uh, in the beginning or earlier on the season where things weren't going really their direction. And now they're hitting their stride, beating Osasuna last week. Uh, and this 4-2 against Celta, um, I think will set them up nicely moving forward as well in the league. Um, we Very quickly, we're going to take a quick question. Um, Brennan Powers, our patron. By the way, if you want responses to your questions and access to more bonus churros, go to patreon.com slash churros y tacticas. Our patron, Brennan Powers, says, um, currently I coach a local private high school in my home state, Delaware, and anytime my team loses or concedes, I feel that it's my fault. But my question is, for the Madrid game, for example, who was at fault for the game? The players or Zidane? Mix of both. Personally, I just try to always be the master of my own domain. So I take everything that goes wrong in my life back to me. Thanks for answering. Mm-hmm. Well, you want to jump on this for us? The answer is that... Interesting question. The answer, I think, is is highly variable. It depends on the context. It depends on the situation. I think, in many ways, you all like the, the the saying of "you ride together, you die together." is kind of holds true because no one is without flaw. No one is perfect, so we all expect each other to make mistakes. We hold each other accountable. We move on. We celebrate together. We fail together. Um, I think. It, it really depends on the situation. So let's say I always bring up that Manchester City game when when this discussion comes up where Manchester City beat Real Madrid at the Etihad and knocked them out of the Champions League and Varane made a couple of really big mistakes uh, and Militao did too. So whose fault was that game on? Well, multiple, multiple people. So Hazard just couldn't get going. Zidane can't control Varane making that mistake or Militao making a mistake. What Zidane can control is how do you set up your team for better press resistance? How can you kind of shrink the field a little bit to bring your players a little bit back further, make the right off-ball runs, make your wingbacks make overlapping runs, make your center midfielders drop deeper? How do you connect the dots? He has to put the team in a position to be able to do that. So that's his fault for not doing that. So Varane was never in that position to... um, so what Varane did was his fault. It was his individual mistake that Zidane can't control that. 
but he can control putting him in a better situation to have a better confident game with better passing outlets. So I mix of both, I think, is the answer. And certainly there will be outliers from time to time. You know, a manager can't control, for example, this week, Nicolas Pepe headbutting the opponent, getting a red card, putting Arsenal in a bad position, and, and Arteta being really upset with that, and that's not Arteta's fault. Um, and then, so I, it highly depends on the situation, and there's no right or wrong answer. There's no cookie-cutter answer, I should say. It's going to depend on the situation every time. Just you do your part, and the players have to buy in and do their part. That's my answer. Well, that's exactly it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you as a coach... And uh, respect to Brendan Powers for uh, uh, coaching there. I've, it's something I've never dabbed in uh, other than on video games and things like that. And I think, you know, you as a coach, will you'll know when you'll see when your players are executing your plans accordingly, uh, you know, regardless of the strategy, you know exactly what it is that you will want your players to do, where you'd want your players to be positioned on the field, where, whether you want your wing backs to be more offensive minded uh, or, you know, sit deeper, what, whatever it might be. I think, uh, take for, or take another example, uh, about a few games ago uh, had, something like 25 or 27 shots on goal. If none of those go in, well, then you as a manager can only do so much. Uh, what you're doing is creating an over- overwhelming dominance from your team's uh, behalf and, 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 and really uh, suffocating your opponent by creating chances, by dominating the game, by dominating the ball, by uh, dominating possessions, creating plays, creating chances after chances. And if through, you know, uh, some sort of miracle or because of the, uh, on that day, the opposition goalkeeper has been blessed by the angels and is having a game of his life and the ball doesn't go in, well, then so be it. Um, I have to think right now of, of, you know, Valencia against Alaves where, they were uh, where Javi Gracia's side were losing uh, after fi- 15 minutes already with 2-0, um, but then obviously managed to get his team back um, in the second half by, and, and, and scoring two goals. And you talked about balls being served on the platter, footballs that is, obviously. Um, don't think bad, Kian. Don't go there. Uh, and, you know, Gamero missed an absolute sitter, what would have probably been yeah. the winner for his team thereby bouncing back 3-2 and, and and taking the three points away but either way i think javi gracia will have con- gone away with that match happy that he did his or that his team uh, responded to his change of tactics uh you know thereby being a clear uh, case and evidence that in fact you know your tactics work that initially you got the game plan wrong um but you know you managed to salvage the situation so the players at the end of the day are the ones obviously that have to put the ball into the back of the net and as we so many times mentioned and and our listeners will know details are or de- i mean games are decided by the smallest of margins and the smallest of details so <clears throat> some things are just simply out of your hand and um because of so many factors the opposition uh, you know the referee uh your players, their talent, the day they might be having, etc. Uh, but I would think that as a coach, you're more or less, you know, you're, you'd be happy, satisfied with what you're getting or seeing from your players, depending on how good their output is and understanding of what is expected from them, that you, you as a coach, have been working on that on a day-to-day basis. We should wrap it up here, Diego, I think. Um... Yeah. Real Madrid has a massive game against Inter this week in the Champions League on it's Wednesday. Big. Barca play a not so big. massive game. Can you, can game you lay down? Game. I don't know if you know, but can you lay, lay out the scenarios for us hopefuls that Madrid don't make it past the, the <laughs> group stage? What what? <laughs> Basically, what has to happen here? The, so obviously a loss. So, <laughs> um, so basically. This group is weird enough that even if Real Madrid lose on Wednesday, they're not out. Oh. If they if they win the next two games, they're they're still going to advance past Inter. Now the problem mm-hmm. is that you don't want to put yourself in that situation anyway because you actually didn't beat Muchin Gladbach and, and Shakhtar previously. So now to all of a sudden have those as do or die games is not something you want to do. So what what you want to happen is obviously you want to beat Inter. 
and and beat them convincingly and build build some confidence. There are some health issues, you know. Obviously, as we saw mm-hmm. against Villarreal, and those who were available are extremely tired. So it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see what Zidane juggles. I don't I don't think if Benzema is going to be back, and if he is back, I don't know if you should necessarily rush him for this game. I. I think you should probably still roll with Mariano and some other variable things like maybe Rodrigo as a false nine, try different things. Um, but uh, it's a big game and Inter probably in better shape than they were last game. And they weren't in terrible shape last game, but Lukaku definitely makes a huge difference and he can be testing for, for players like, uh, for Real Madrid's defenders who are missing Ramos. And the thought of him like tab- towering over Nacho or Carvajal is, is not fun. So, you know, Casemiro out too, right? Excuse me, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken. Casemiro, I'd have to. I haven't been up to date with today's training session to know what his status is. So I'm a little bit on the spot. With bit, that I mean, if it if it is the case, I, I know with Ramos how the wins loss ratio takes a massive hit. Yeah, um, I want to say with Casemiro, it's it's, it's similar. Um, let me just quickly. Update you all. So Real Madrid training session today. Um, Benzema and Orgerzola did not train with the group. I That may mean Casemiro did, but I'm not sure. Benzema's back. That's that's so then he that which means he might make it. Um, I think Casemiro was there, but I'm not sure. Actually, I don't see him okay. either. Okay. I don't know. I'm sorry for the terrible answer, to all the listeners. Uh, no, I, I haven't. I haven't been. No this is still early in my time, so I'm not. I haven't been up to date on today's news. Of course, completely. But yeah. No, no. Um. All right. All right, man. So we'll be back. Well, Friday at the setting latest. Setting us up for a, a thrilling Friday pod. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. For sure. Um, we'll see what happens, man. Make sure to join patreon.com slash churros tacticas for the Friday pod. Follow us on Twitter at churros tacticas. Have a great week and stay safe. You too, man. Thanks, Diego. Take care. You too. Stay blessed. Ciao, ciao.